Okay, so now we're going to talk about federated identity management. And this is one of the more complicated pieces of the lecture and one of the things that I've seen students get confused on in exams and uh, assignments after, um, uh, after the lecture quite a bit. So I'm going to start off with this very high-level overview of the goal of federated identity management. And, and then we're going to go through a number of technologies that achieve, uh, to varying degrees, parts of this goal. Okay, so let's just focus at the super high level on this goal. Uh, the idea is that you want to be able to log into a third party service provider without necessarily having to create authentication credentials for every single third party service provider. Uh, most of the time, the, the way that you'll actually do this is that you will already leverage an existing authentication credential that you have at some other system, right? And we'll refer to that other place as an identity management system. Okay, so in this case, let's imagine that we're trying to post a comment on a blog, and the blog is our third-party service provider, right? We're, we're interested in logging into this blog without having to have authentication credentials that are specifically set up for that one blog. Uh, and in this case, we'll think of Facebook as our identity management system. So we want to post comments on this blog using our Facebook identity. Uh, and we'll walk through the steps here. This is kind of like a high-level overview. It may not be the exact best description of how this plays out for Facebook, but it does give you a sense of like the goal of federated identity management. Uh, you want to place a request with a third-party service provider. I need access to post a comment, right? This is your access request. As soon as the third-party service provider receives that request, they communicate with the identity management system to say, so-and-so is providing your credentials as a way for us to create an account that would be authorized to post a comment on this particular blog. Now, if you're already logged into Facebook, you don't have to do these dotted line uh, pieces. If you are not logged into Facebook, then they would push a request to you, probably through some kind of a no notification system, uh, to say, hey, you need to log into Facebook so that we can respond to this request as to whether or not you are who you say you are. Uh, and then once you have logged in, once you've provided your authentication credentials, then Facebook, your identity management system provider, can actually respond to that request from the blog. And then if you are granted access, you'd be able to post a comment, right? Of course, this access response could just be a denial, right? Imagine that somebody is trying to post a comment to this blog as if they were you. You might receive an authentication request on your phone out of nowhere and then just deny it. And at that point, this authorization response that the blog receives would be negative and the access response would be, no, I'm sorry, you can't post this comment something like that. So that's the idea behind federated identity management. I don't think this is a particularly complicated uh, outline. The place where people end up getting confused is there are lots and lots of different technologies that are used to achieve very similar setups, um, including single sign-on. And like a single sign-on technology like the UMBC account that you have that gives you access to all kinds of services, right? Services that are provided by UMBC uh, is, is maybe the, uh, the best example of something where people can kind of get confused as to whether or not it's federated or something else. Uh, and, and that's a little bit tricky. It's also tricky and problematic in the sense that whatever identity management system you're probably using also provides services. So Facebook is a good example of this. There are also services available at Facebook for which this whole picture doesn't really apply because you're already logging in directly as a first party service provider to Facebook. So there are parts that this can get confusing and hopefully if you find yourself confused in any of these, you can go back and rewatch uh, that section of the, the lecture and ask questions to me afterwards uh, if you're still confused. Okay, so let's talk about one specific technology that can be used to achieve federated identity management, and that's SAML, the Security Assertion Markup Language. Essentially, it's just an XML-based standard that defines that protocol for systems that are attempting to exchange these identity credentials and privilege information. It's very commonly used to give employees access to corporate cloud subscriptions. So you can think again of like the My UMBC example. Your UMBC account is going to give you access to a wide variety of services that are available to you as a student here at UMBC in exactly the same way that an employee account at a large company, imagine Advanced Micro Devices, the company that I worked at, is going to give you access to a large number of services that are provided by, uh, by the organization internally. Now the, the real advantage of doing this from a uh, employer context is that if the employee leaves the company, whether they're fired or they just choose to leave, you can disable all of their login credentials 
simply by disabling the rights to that cloud service uh, authentication provider. So going back to the high level overview, instead of having to go through every service and delete these authentication accounts, you just delete this one and then all the third parties that depended upon this identity management provider uh, are, are kind of disabled by default. So you only have that one identity that you have to manage. You don't have to worry about managing all of these other different identities as an employer. Uh, another way of thinking about this is if UMBC, uh, maybe you leave UMBC, let's say you graduate or you, you, know, you end up just deciding to transfer or something else happens and you have to leave the university. UMBC can disable your identity just in one place rather than going through every possible third party service that you interacted with during your time at UMBC. So the company is always in control of the authorization piece. The company is always in control of the identity piece. Um, and that's the really critical advantage of using something like SAML. Uh, here's how SAML in particular works. And this is going to look very similar to that overview that we had at the very beginning for federated identity management plans. It is a little bit different, right, in the sense that we are now mediating everything through the browser that the user is on, right, rather than having direct behind the scenes communications. Um, and that's actually how SAML works in practice, that this all ends up going through essentially the browser that you see here in step three, rather than this indirect communication that you would see in the previous slide, right? In this slide, you're kind of seeing this communication happen behind the scenes somewhere in the cloud. In the other layout, this is all happening through the user, through the user's browser in particular. Okay, so the SAML authentication process is very similar to what we were talking about, but those steps three and four are mediated by the browser. Everything else is essentially the same. And again, this example is from the textbook. If you're going through the textbook, there's uh, the textbook will walk you through this in a lot more detail, but I just wanted to connect it more directly to that high-level overview of federated identity management. Okay, so now let's talk about OAuth. So SAML is an authentication standard. OAuth is an authorization standard. Right, so the part that we were talking about in the high-level overview for uh, for federated identity management, all the authorization stuff happens here. Right, the identity management system has to do the authorization. Right, you've got this authorization request to the identity management system, and then you get a response from the uh, authorization system. Uh, with OAuth, uh, you don't just have that request going to uh, to to the identity management. Piece. It's actually an authorization standard as well. So OAuth allows a user to do some stuff that you can't do in a traditional SAML application. Uh, in particular, it allows for third-party applications to access APIs on the user's behalf with no mediated communication in between. So you, the user, do not have to make a request every single time an OAuth-enabled third-party application needs access to information. Right, So when Facebook or Twitter is asking a user if a new application can have access to the photos on their account, that's an OAuth request, and it means that whatever third-party application uh, needs access, they can get access whenever they need it. They just use those tokens. Uh, you don't have to have the user mediating any of this sort of stuff the way that you would, for example, in the SAML process where the user's browser is a critical mediating component of the authentication piece. OAuth just gives the third-party application access not only to the to well only to the account resources they need, but not just through the sharing of passwords. Now, you, the user, at this point can revoke access because OAuth is a protocol that includes your ability to do this revocation, um, and you should be able to manage it, monitor it. Most app, most implementations of this will provide a notification system where you'd be able to see what they've actually accessed and when. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than the traditional federated system because you now have to, uh, you're no longer directly involved in that process. Okay, so let's look at an example of how OAuth actually uh, works. And this is a little bit of a complicated example that spans two different slides. So I'll do the best that I can to keep us, uh, keep us on target here. Now the resource owner is the user. That's that first column here. This is you, the user, the, the person who's actually in charge of uh, the account. Now, the client in this particular case is whatever app or website you want to use uh, your, that, that would need access to uh, some of your information. So, for example, this client could be a blog, right? And then the authorization server is actually the, uh, the server that's doing the authorization authentication piece. Now, that's probably going to be something like Facebook or Twitter, and the resource server, it's defined through OAuth such that these can be separate systems. Uh, 
but most of the time when you're using them, they are one and the same. So the authorization server here would be Facebook. This is sort of like tying it to your Facebook identity. And the resource server is typically also Facebook. For example, somebody is trying to request access to the photos you've posted on Facebook, right? In this case, the authorization is provided through Facebook and also the photos are provided through Facebook. But the way OAuth is defined, this resource server can be entirely different, right? It does not have to be Facebook. Then finally, the client is the app or website that you're actually trying to give access to stuff, right? Whatever that stuff may be. Okay, so the, the flow here is you've installed a client or application, you've registered with this client, you have an account with a client, and you are now trying to prepare and provide access to some other resource, right? Eventually you want to give access to these resources, and this is such a complicated protocol, you don't even see it on this particular screen. Um, but in order to get access to this resource, you kind of have to go through this whole dance beforehand before you can even begin to do that. Uh, so you've got the application, you're preparing this request. The first step is to try and author authenticate with the authorization server. So they're accepting this token request that you've provided here, and you have to now log in to your authentication server. This is sort of like, uh, when this client says, hey, Facebook, so-and-so is trying to log in and give me access to the photos, Can do you even know who this person is? Well, Facebook, if you're not currently logged in, they're going to say, I have no idea who this is. Let's log them in and see. And then you get the login credentials. Assuming you log in correctly, you could actually allow the resource owner, that's the user, to limit the scope of the client's access by saying, you know, this client is requesting access to all of your photos throughout the entire history you've had an account with us. Are you sure you want to give them access to all of this sort of stuff? And then you, the user, get to make a choice. That's what this diamond refers to, is somebody has to make a decision uh, as to what access rights you want to provide to the client through this authorization protocol. And that can be pretty fine detail, pretty fine grain. There's actually... Uh, quite a bit of opportunity there for customization. In practice, this choice ends up being uh, more uh, high level because users don't generally like dealing with like a yes or no for every single photo they've ever created. They're more happy to just say blanketly, give them access to everything, um, or you know, don't give them access to anything, something like that. Okay, once you've selected the access rights though, the authorization server now has essentially everything they need to provide the final authorization Right, So they go to the user and say, okay, this is the final thing that we're going to give access to. Is this really what you want? That authorization code is going to be approved by the user for the client. And, and the user has to provide it to the client. Notice that this is not actually coming directly from the authorization server. Right, It's coming from the user to provide access. Now, once they have this authorization code, once the client has this authorization code, notice all of the access happens after the user's involved, right? At this point, the user no longer has any involvement and whatever application you're interested in providing access to, they can just make access requests directly. They don't need you at that point. They already have the authorization code. And that's all the second half of this is really walking through. You've got this authentication client that ends up providing these tokens. And eventually, once you have the token, you can go directly to the resource server. Now, the resource server will go to your authentication server for your behalf every time these access requests happen. And this is generally the point where you would see logging that could eventually be reviewed by a user, but it's not the user itself, right? The user is no longer involved in the process. It's just the authorization server. Now, when this and this are both Facebook, right? The authorization server and the resource server are both Facebook. All of this happens internally and very, very quickly. Uh, if they are different, which can happen, it isn't the most common way this stuff is set up, then you still have these requests happening automatically in the background with no user intervention because they have a, an accepted token. You've given them this authorization token, whatever client it is that you're interested in providing access to, and you don't, you don't have to be involved in that process. This could happen while you're asleep. It could happen while you're logged off on vacation. doesn't matter. They have the access token. They can just make these requests. Okay, so that's the main difference between OAuth and something like SAML in terms of federated identity management. Uh, there is one more technology that's worth talking about, and that is OpenID Connect. Okay, OAuth has actually been extended to support authentication in the form of OpenID Connect. Uh, this is a relatively new standard for federated identity management provides a lot better support for native applications, meaning desktop applications rather than web applications, because a desktop application isn't going to have access to browser cookies, right? So the, the whole idea behind are they currently logged into a browser that federated identity management, and in particular SAML, has relied on for a while, does not work when native applications think mobile applications that are not web pages, but actual native code applications on the, on the phone itself, um, kind of requires additional 
uh, background protocols to be able to work. That's what OpenID Connect is intended to provide. Now, they do this by adding an identity token to the existing authorization token. So in this last half, instead of having just an authorization token that's been provided to the client, there would also be an identity token that's provided to the client. And that could persist for a while, right? Treating identity information as if it was just any other authorization. Uh, so you wouldn't even necessarily have to be involved in doing that sort of login. This can be much more problematic from a security standpoint, but in practice, because most of the time these applications are mobile applications on phones, uh, and you have access to your phone, it's not as problematic. Uh, the place where it is uh, kind of, to give you an example of like a, a security problem that would be associated with something like this, if the police were able to get your phone and they were able to unlock your phone, then they don't need, like Facebook would not need a request from you to give access to any of the OpenID Connect applications that already have access to your Facebook photos, right? If you have an application on your phone that you've given access to, <coughs> pardon me, even if you've logged out of Facebook, that phone would still have access to your photos because the identity credential is another one of your authorization tokens, then they'd be able to log you in. All right, so this is uh, the last piece that we wanted to talk about in the Federated Identity Management uh, section of the lecture. There are lots of other technologies that apply to Federated Identity Management, and this is not the end of the story by, by any means. It's really just a, an overview with a few specific examples. And if you're interested in walking through some of the examples that we saw from the textbook, namely the SAML authentication process, <coughs> pardon me, and the OAuth authorization process, the textbook does have better natural language descriptions of those.